From Deloitte Tax and Legal Japan, welcome to The Japan Perspective. This is a podcast where we speak to specialists from across Deloitte to discuss the latest business issues impacting foreign multinational companies in Japan. I'm your host, Joanna Hazel. Today's episode is about Electronic Record Retention Law, or ERRL, and the changes to the law that are about to be enacted in the new year starting January 1st, 2024. This episode will be the first of a series we are doing on ERRL and the varying implications it will have on businesses. Today's guest is David Bickle. David is a partner in the Business Tax Services team in Deloitte, Tokyo. David has served many clients in assisting them with transitioning their business to be more technologically advanced and strengthen their IT infrastructure. So David, it seems we've been hearing a lot about tax and technology for a while now. Thanks, Joanna, that's right. We've certainly seen a government desire to promote a more resilient business infrastructure and also to engage with taxpayers around digital processes. So for example, in recent years, we've seen investments to invest in the cloud. We've seen the tax authorities upon audits now asking for direct access to taxpayer systems. We've had the introduction of e-filing. And now, of course, we have these changes around the electronic record retention law or the ERRL. Okay. So this shift to a more resilient IT infrastructure, is this something that we've seen having a wide ranging impact on taxpayers here in Japan? Yeah, certainly. And particularly with these changes around the electronic record retention law, Um, This is something that pretty much impacts on all taxpayers. We've actually had a couple of major changes in Japan in recent months. Back at the beginning of October, we had the introduction of qualified invoicing around the consumption tax that affected pretty much all taxpayers. And this change to the ERRL is on a similar scale in that it affects most of the taxpayers here in Japan. Got it. But it's my understanding that the ability to store documents online for tax purposes, this is not new. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. The The rules around the electronic storage of data have been in place for a number of years. And companies, if they so wish to, maybe to reduce the storage costs of paper or towards moving towards a more robust Uh, data environment within their organizations, they have been able to apply for a number of years now to store their records and data electronically. Mm -hmm. And from what you've seen in practice, has the take up and the implementation been good here in Japan? Well, not really. Uh, Until recent years, the uh, take up was pretty slow. And I think that's because the uh, the applications process and the hurdles that had to be crossed were were pretty onerous and it was quite complex and burdensome for companies actually to apply to get approval to store their records uh, you know, electronically and to dispense with the paper. So what I'm hearing is that ERL is pretty wide ranging in terms of the scope of documents that it covers. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And it pretty much covers all of the documents that companies may be referring to in connection with the disclosures they have in their tax returns and so that they need for to support their tax compliance process. So you have really four buckets of information, uh, four different kinds of information in support of tax returns and the disclosures in the tax returns. Firstly, a company has its books and records. Uh, Secondly, there is paper that it creates. So that may be invoices, which is issuing to customers. Then there's another group of information, which is the paper that it receives, which can be receipts um, uh, and also invoices from its own stakeholders and vendors. And then fourthly, you have this, uh, the electronic record retention law, the electronic transaction records, which is information which has never existed before in paper form. I see. So I'm curious, why are the tax authorities getting involved in regulating IT systems? Well, tax audits are a fundamental part of how the tax authorities in Japan manage the tax compliance process. Um, They want to be comfortable, tax examiners want to be comfortable when they come to do an audit that any company which has decided to not 
keep paper records and to store its information online, that fundamentally that information is going to be uh, available to them and it won't have been tampered or altered. And also if there's specific pieces of information that a uh, tax examiner wants, they want to be confident that the taxpayer having dispensed with paper documentation is going to be able to find uh, the specific information they want, the specific records they want from amongst its digital systems. Okay, so if these rules have been around for a while, what is the fuss about now and what exactly is the issue here? Yeah, well, it's really to do with closing down the options available or closing down a number of the options available to taxpayers if they don't store the documents correctly in a compliant manner. So until now, you or taxpayers had the option during an audit uh, to uh, fall back and print a hard copy. So for example, if the tax inspector had decided that their data storage system, their electronic storage system did not meet the requirements under the tax law, it was an, always an option for the taxpayer to say, hang on, hold on a minute, let me go to my printer, I'll print you out that document, then to bring a paper document, and that would suffice and generally speaking would be acceptable uh, by the taxpayers. Now, the big change is that from the 1st of January 2024, the 1st of January next year, for the electronic transaction records, so these documents that have never ever been in paper format, paper is not going to be an option. So the documentation has to be stored correctly in a compliant system. And if it's not, effectively, the tax authorities can deem that documentation not to exist. And the taxpayer does not have the option to say, hey, let me go and print it out and, and show you a paper copy. That's no longer acceptable. Okay. So what exactly is the NTA looking for in the context of ERL? Yeah, well, firstly, they want to be confident that the data that companies are storing digitally is not going to be manipulated, changed or deleted once it's been stored. And we refer to that as integrity. And so there are a number of requirements in the tax law designed to provide some assurance, if you like, over integrity. And then secondly, the uh, tax authorities want to make sure that the taxpayers are able to disclose the information that a tax inspector may want to see during an audit. So uh, this is what we call readability. And there's a number of rules, again, designed to provide the authorities with some kind of assurance that there's going to be adequate readability of data and that taxpayers can present the kind of documents, electronic documents that a tax inspector may, may want to see. Can you tell me a little bit more about the integrity and readability? What is it that the NTA is asking taxpayers to do with regards to those? Yeah, I mean, there's a number of ways that these uh, uh, requirements can be satisfied. So firstly, for integrity, uh, this can be addressed through technology solutions, for example, using time stamping technology when uh, scanning uh, information into systems. Um, it can also be dealt with by having a written policy, uh, a company putting a policy in place that guides how they will store uh, information in their systems and what, and what controls they have. Um, and readability, though, is all about uh, well, firstly, having the right kind of hardware. So at a very fundamental level to make sure you've got the right kinds of screens and there's adequate resolution and color and things like that. So uh, a tax inspector would be able to look at it if you're pulling up records from your, your systems. Um, but also very importantly, there is the search functionality. So the tax inspectors are very keen that uh, taxpayers will be able to search their electronically stored data in a number of different ways uh, to be able to locate specific documents and records from amongst the mass of data that they have. Got it. So this all sounds quite involved with, you know, written policies and search functions. What happens if the NTA finds taxpayers to be non-compliant with ERRL? Yeah, so as I was saying before, fundamentally, if the electronic transaction records are not stored in a compliant data solution, so the ERP system or the SharePoint system does not satisfy the tax rules, then in a worst case scenario, a tax inspector can deem that document not to exist. And then uh, if you're looking for support for deductions that you're making in your tax return, for example, 
the fact that you don't have support, documentary support for those deductions you're taking in your returns, that gives the tax uh, authorities latitude to uh, make additional assessments. And in a real worst case scenario, uh, well, many companies in Japan have something called blue form status. Uh, blue form taxpayer status gives a taxpayer uh, certain privileges. For example, they're allowed to carry uh, losses forward from one year to another. They're also allowed to take certain tax credits. Um, the, the quid pro quo, if you like, for having that privilege status is that taxpayers commit to storing uh, and keeping adequate books and records. So um, if a company is seen to be failing to store its electronic transaction records in a compliant way, there's uh, theoretically at, at least a risk that the, the blue form status could be forfeited, which can have uh, you know, a very significant impact for companies, which are saying um, carrying forward significant losses and things like that, if that would mean those losses are forfeited. That is quite significant. Thanks, David. So in practice, how do you recommend taxpayers go about getting ready for these changes? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is actually for any business to understand uh, what documents that they use for that business fall under the definition of electronic transaction record. And then knowing where in their organization, in their systems, where they're storing those electronic transaction records. So is it in the ERP system? Is it in SharePoint? Uh, even is it stored on the hard drives of laptops of uh, individual members of the organization? Uh, once they know where the electronic transaction records are stored, then it's about doing an assessment of that storage, to storage solution to see whether or not it satisfies the requirements set out in the tax law. And then uh, there may be gaps. If there are any gaps, it's all about remediation, coming up with a plan to close those gaps so they can be confident that they are uh, compliant with the new rules going forward. Got it. So in terms of coming up with a plan, you know, we're quickly approaching the end of 2023 and this is coming into effect January 1st of 2024. So is it too late for taxpayers to act now? What advice do you have as a, as a professional to these taxpayers who need to get started on this? Yeah, no, I mean, for, for those taxpayers that find themselves unprepared, I think the mantra, mantra is it is never too late to start to do the right thing. So even if companies uh, feel that they're uh, a bit behind time or they feel that they haven't done adequate uh, analysis to assess their compliance with the new rules, uh, the best thing to do is just to begin that process. And even if it takes longer and into next year, um, that's the best way to demonstrate that you're a responsible taxpayer is if you have a good story about how you are actively trying to do your best to comply with the new rules. Better late than never, as they say. Indeed. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much, David, for joining. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in. As previously mentioned, this is the first of a series we'll be doing on ERRL, so please look forward to our next episode where Hideo Arai and I will be discussing more about tax and technology. In the meantime, please feel free to reach out to either David or I on LinkedIn, and we'll see you next time.